Judaism, Part 1 The Overview To understand Judaism and the Jewish religion and the Jewish people uh, historically, we have to begin as far back as around 17 to 1800 BC, but even uh, beyond that, we have to look not only at what the Old Testament says about the creation of the Jewish people, we have to understand what the uh, historical and cultural context was for all of those events uh, in a broader sense. The ancient Near Eastern cultures like Samaria, Mesopotamia, Chaldea, the Akkadians, the, the uh, Hurrians, all of these uh, people and dynasties that existed from ancient times and then moving down to uh, around 1800 BC when the Jews formally began to emerge through the calling of Abram by Yahweh. <clears throat> so, uh, to give you an overview of what's covered in Jewish history, we have to start with the Jewish and biblical belief that there is one truth, and that truth is about Yahweh, the one true God himself, and that all other views that oppose Yahweh or that run counter to his essence, his identity, his character, are false and therefore constitute the great lie that has deceived humanity for ages. Uh, I also need to clarify something here in terms of the divine council and the eternal domain, the creative metaphysical domain, and the empirical plus domain. Uh, it is assumed by a lot of people, even people in the church, that evil and sin came into the world, biblically speaking, when the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, uh, were deceived in the Garden of Eden and rebelled against God. Now, while that narrative is in the Bible, and you know, personally I believe it's an accurate you know, telling of, of the story of what happened, the Bible doesn't say that's where evil first began. And that's a misconception some people have. In fact, evil began long before that and was the result of a rebellion of another being, a spiritual entity who was an angel who rebelled against God because he envied God and coveted God's position and wanted to replace Yahweh with himself. Uh, you may know him being described as Satan or Lucifer, and I've told you in the past, Satan is not a name, neither is Lucifer, they're descriptive terms. Satan meaning the accuser, the adversary, uh, the opposer, and Lucifer being a word that means the brilliant or shining one. Now, uh, we're not really told in the Bible the name of this entity, and I think there are reasons for that, which if we have time I might get into at some point for you, but we are clearly told that this entity, this spiritual being, fell from God's grace and was cast out of the divine council kingdom in the metaphysical created domain, and when he was cast out, he convinced a significant number, the Bible says one-third, of the angels in heaven to rebel with him. And from that time, which long predated the existence of Adam and Eve, a war began and occurred in the cosmic realm, in the metaphysical realm, and the empirical plus realm. And that war is still going on today, according to to a Jewish belief, and now according to a Christian belief, which originally came out of Judaism. So that has to be understood. This cosmic war among the members of the Divine Council is the source or the origin of evil. Now I need to explain one thing to you. You cannot have evil unless you first have good, because evil is the antithesis or the attempt to cancel out good and overthrow it. Well, evil can only exist, therefore, if there is goodness in the first place that can be opposed. All right? So, uh, this is what happened, the backdrop, the story. Biblically, this is very clear in Genesis chapter 3, where we're told that Nakesh, the serpent dragon, the chaos dragon, who was this fallen angel, came to the garden and tempted Adam and Eve to rebel against God and convinced Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit, which, by the way, was not her first understanding of what goodness was, but 
did become her understanding of what evil was. Because she already knew goodness, and so did Adam. They walked in the garden with God every day, the story says. So they had the fullest expression of goodness with them directly, face to face, every day. So it becomes remarkable when you think about it that they would choose against that and choose for evil and all of the destructive, nihilistic forces that come to play after that. I would also tell you that uh, as such, this first rebel, Satan, Lucifer, this fallen angel, became the first true nihilist. Nihilism being nothingness and the negation of everything that had meaning and purpose that came before, including goodness, including what is right versus what's wrong. So this entity became the first nihilist, and I would suggest to you that all nihilistic philosophy from that time forward comes originally from his rebellion and all rebellion against God and what's right and goodness to this day is an expression of that kind of nihilistic tendency. So we began with that story and I would tell you that the Akkadian uh, narratives from ancient Mesopotamia that date back to 6, 7,000, 8,000 BC, the uh, Mesopotamian, Chaldean, Sumerian narratives tell the same stories. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, who is described as a being of giant stature, who was two-thirds uh, divine and one-third human. He was a hybrid offspring of gods and humans. Uh, all of those narratives, which are not in the Bible, tell the same story, just changing the names and sometimes changing the spin on who is depicted as uh, the good guy and who's depicted as the bad guy. And this, of course, results in a great conflict when the Jews emerge between Yahweh and these other gods and goddesses who I believe, biblically speaking, are the rebels who rebelled against God in the divine realm in the first place and now occupy influential positions in one fashion or another on the earth. And this is the beginning point of understanding Judaism. It is not about just a group of people that God singled out and gave them rules. It's about a war between Yahweh himself and the fallen ones who, uh, in extra-biblical literature like the Book of Enoch or Jubilees, um, are, are described sometimes as the Watchers. But these are the fallen ones who came down on Mount Hermon and made a pact. Mount Hermon, by the way, is the mountain of curse, is what it means. And they made a pact that if they did not oppose God altogether and attempt to destroy the image of God in man, that uh, they would all be cursed. Ironically, they all were cursed anyway by their very decision to rebel against God. So, that's the back story. Uh, again, Judaism doesn't really make good sense and doesn't really give a complete satisfying response to the issue of good versus evil unless you understand that backdrop. So the Jews emerge in that context of this cosmic war between God and his holy angels, his uh, the, the uh, divine council, and the fallen ones who have been cast out. All right? So that's the background. The uh, fallen ones who were cast out, of course, have lost the image of God. They have sacrificed it to their own desires, their own lusts. And uh, as a result of that, that fall from grace becomes complete, and there's no redemption for those fallen ones. Uh, however, when humanity rebelled against God, God in his grace prevented an absolute fall from grace, so therefore the image of God was still retained in humans, and therefore redemption is possible because uh, through God's saving work, he eradicates the power of evil and death and destruction, the power of nihilism, and brings humanity back into a relationship with himself where the restoration of his full image is in process. It's not complete yet, according to the Bible, but one day it will be. And uh, humanity will become everything it was intended to be from the beginning. 
the uh, fallen ones are described as the B'nai Elohim, which means the, the sons of God, not sons of God in the sense that we're all children of God, but the sons of God as divine beings who rebelled. Okay, and this is very clear. The only time that phrase is used in the Bible is just a few times. Every time it references the fallen angels. Um, Genesis chapter 6 says, They took it upon themselves to corrupt humanity by engaging in illicit relations with humanity. And one of those illicit relations had to do with sexual union between these fallen angels and human women. And the offspring they produced were considered men, uh, of great stature and power, but who were absolutely corrupt and evil. They were called the Nephilim, later referred to as the Rephaim. And the, the result of this was so much evil on the earth that the flood was the result to, to wipe out those fallen beings, who, by the way, were the unredeemables. They could not be brought back into relationship with God. Following the flood, you have the appearance of Nimrod, the Tower of Babel being built, which, by the way, archaeologically, I was just reading an article on this, archaeologically, the Tower of Babel, uh, the ziggurat ruins, has been discovered, and there, there is a you know, significant uh, agreement that it is the actual site of Nimrod's Tower of, of Babel. And, of course, Nimrod was identified as one of the uh, offspring of the uh, sons of God and the daughters of men, the Nephilim. So, anyway, that's all the backdrop. And so, by the time we get to around 18, 17, 1800 B.C., God steps in and he chooses one man, Abram, to forge a relationship with, and through Abram and his wife, Sarah, to create a people who would be set apart as God's people and then become the source that he uses to overthrow the watchers, the fallen angels, the uh, Baal gods that are described in the Old Testament as uh, these fallen ones, and to restore to the entire world his goodness, his righteousness, and to make the entire world perfect and whole again, including the people in it. And the Jews were called to be a light to all the other tribes, all the other peoples, to help them desire to return to a relationship with Yahweh. Now, there are a lot of problems that occurred out of that because sometimes the Jews didn't fulfill their calling very well. Uh, and this led to great problems. In fact, sometimes under the, the kings of Judah and Israel, the uh, Jews fell into the same rebellion as the fallen angels, even venerating fallen angels through some pretty horrible practices that I've talked to you about before, like uh, human sacrifice, infant sacrifice, blood drinking, and cannibalism. You know, I've told you before that the word kana, words kanab al means the priest of Baal, the fallen gods. And uh, that, of course, is, is where we derive the word cannibal from. Now, Around 1800 or so, 17 to 1800, thereabouts, that's approximation, God calls Abram out of southeast Turkey, where, by the way, in Lebanon and Turkey, you find the oldest and largest ritual ruins ever found in the world. Uh, Karahan Tepe, which is a very new discovery, uh, Gobekli Tepe, and Baalbek. So those ruins were very ancient, but this is where Abram came from. The significance of that is he was likely very familiar with the kind of worship and veneration of the fallen angels that was going on there. In fact, it's uh, not only plausible, but likely that he participated in those and was worshiping false gods. But God saw something in Abram, and he calls him out and says, I want to draw you out of all this, and you will become, through you, you will become the source of blessing for all people all over the earth because of your offspring. Now, it's interesting that he says your seed through your seed or your offspring, but the word in Hebrew and Greek is singular. It's not peoples. It's through your one offspring, your one descendant. And Paul in the book of Galatians makes the point that this one seed or this one offspring is actually Jesus Christ, 
who came as the fullest expression of God in the flesh, and then through his death and suffering on the cross and resurrection, overturns the dark power of the fallen angels. And he does this coming through the line of the Jews. Jesus was born Jewish. So, uh, God, in fact, does, in the biblical narrative, accomplish his goal. But the conflict is not yet ended. There still is more to be done. And this involves the struggle that people have with, with sin and evil today and has to do with the role of human free will to make choices either for Yahweh and his goodness and righteousness or against Yahweh and to embrace the, uh, the vision of the fallen angels, which is to undo everything good and righteous. Okay? Now, they don't present their agenda in that way. Rather, it's presented, and you can see this in extra biblical text, it's presented as though they are the good ones who are trying to free and liberate humanity from bondage. But the truth of it is, they are taking people into captivity and bondage, that only God in his love is truly liberating. Now, if you want a fuller treatment of this, I would invite you to just take a little time and read chapter 5 of the book of Galatians in the New Testament. And it's a really good, clear, detailed explanation of this contrast between bondage and freedom. And you've heard me talk about before how uh, religion is a, uh, a, is a system of bondage from which the only escape is God's intervention. And of course, as I've said, the Bible indicates both in the Old Testament, this would come through the appearance of the Messiah, uh, and in the New Testament, the identification of Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the fulfillment of that promise. Now, uh, as we move forward, of course, there are conflicts that begin to ar arise because of Abraham's foolish decision to conceive a child on the handmaiden Hagar because he didn't trust God that he would conceive a child through Sarah because of her age. And that child Ishmael becomes the father of 12 tribes, which God does bless back at that time. And in fact, some of the, those tribes are protected from destruction by God when Israel or the Jews invade Canaan and conquer it. But there eventually was conflict between between the 12 tribes of Ishmael and the 12 tribes of Israel um, because I believe because of a desire to assert which of those groups truly comprised the Jewish people and the people of, of uh, blessing for the whole world. Biblically, we're told that it is the children of Israel uh, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and those 12 tribes that come out of that line, which is also the lineage for Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, over the course of time, the Jews end up being enslaved and in captivity and hated by the nations around them far more often than they are viewed positively and blessed. Uh, this is everything from the uh, Jewish captivity in Egypt to the Assyrian captivity in the Fertile Crescent to the Babylonian conquest and then the Medo-Persian conquest, eventually the Greek conquest, and, uh, and then by the time of Jesus, the Roman domination. There was only a period of a, uh, a relatively brief period of about 300 years or so where the Jews actually were a free people and were the dominant kingdom in the Near East. And this was, of course, uh, under King David and Solomon around 1000 to 1100 BC and down to around uh, 8900. So the domination of the Jews in the, in the world was very short and short-lived. It is interesting also to notice all of these kingdoms I mentioned rose and fell and disappeared other kingdoms rose and fell and disappeared from the Middle Ages forward. Uh, and you might think about even, you know, if you want to call them kingdoms, but regimes like Stalin in Russia, who hated the Jews, or like uh, Hitler in Nazi Germany, who, as we know, 
spearheaded the Holocaust to try to wipe out the Jews entirely. And now we're seeing a rise again of a lot of anti-Semitism directed toward the Jews and what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, Iran has expressed for decades now its commitment to completely wipe out the Jews. In fact, uh, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, My Struggle, the text he wrote about uh, Arianism and you know, hating the Jews, is a popular text among the more, what I would say is conservatively committed Muslims in the world today. And Iran has made its commitment along those same lines. The cosmic war that began long before the existence of human beings on this planet, and certainly long before the setting apart of the Jewish people as God's a special people to bless the world. That conflict is carried out visibly in the conquest of the land of Canaan under Joshua and Caleb, who were servants of Moses, when Moses delivered the children of Israel from captivity in Egypt, and then they wandered in the wilderness, and the great conflict between Yahweh and the moon god Sin, one of the fallen angels, occurred on Mount Horeb in what is known as the Sinai or Sinai wilderness. Uh, Sinai meaning the, the stronghold or fortress of the moon god. And out of that came what we call the Ten Commandments, which are not commandments at all. The Hebrew word is ten words of advice or good counsel. So these ten things were things God gave to the Israelites in contrast to what other nations were teaching should be done in terms of how people live. And he said these ten things are not rules to follow, but they are good counsel that if you do abide by them, you and those you love will be blessed. And they were charged to share those sound counsel words with the entire world and to make that visible by how they lived and treated one another. So when they leave the wilderness and go to the Jordan River to go into Canaan and conquer Canaan, Part of what's going on there is this conflict is still happening between Yahweh and the fallen angels. And the tribes, there are about, if you count the Philistines who came a couple of hundred years later, if you count them, there were eight tribes that were, that were identified as Rephaim tribes or the venerators of the fallen angels and the direct lineage descendants of the illicit relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Uh, this is why when the spies spied out the land, and they went to Jericho, for example, they described the inhabitants as giants, being of large stature and being very powerful, but being also absolutely evil. And so in that conquest, God says, here are the tribes you need to really be, a, be wary of because they are the fallen angel tribes, and you need to, to oppose them, have nothing to do with them, don't follow their teachings, don't intermarry, have nothing to do with them, and if they make war with you, I will fight with you, and you need to destroy them all. And they're also called the Rephaim tribes, which references them as the unredeemables. They cannot be brought into a salvation relationship with Yahweh. Okay? So that was going on, and that was part of the conquest. However, there were a number of tribes, about seven or eight, that were described as not Rephaim and therefore should be treated with hostility and with dignity and respect. And uh, it was okay to intermarry with them and do business and so forth. So I hope that clarifies very quickly that God was not just an arbitrary, capricious God who hated some people and killed them and liked some other people and didn't kill them and no one knows why he chose one over the other. That's not the story in the Bible. And that's why it's so important to understand this backstory of the divine conflict that had been occurring for uh, millennia, much longer than humans existed on the earth. So the Jews are being used to engage in that conflict. And the fallen angels, we're told in the Bible, know it. And they hate the Jews because they know that the Jews are the source God is using to overturn their dark agenda. So they also seem to come to recognize 
the prophecies about the coming one, the seed from Abraham, who is going to be the Redeemer, the Messiah. And so they set out to destroy the Jews to prevent that, the birth of that one. And of course the Bible says they fail in doing so, and that one is actually born. But then, unwittingly, they seek to kill that one to prevent God's plans from occurring, but they don't understand that in doing so, they played right into God's plans, and that one rises from the dead to never suffer death again and promises resurrection to all who follow him. Again, not just to Jews, but Jews and Gentiles alike. So, after the conquest of Canaan, and after David and Solomon's kingdom, and Solomon dies, the kingdom splits due to civil strife into the northern and southern kingdoms, kingdoms of, uh, of Israel and Judah. And in those two kingdoms, they set up their own line of kings, and there's about 20, a little over 20 kings over the next several hundred years in both the northern and the southern kingdom. Sadly, in both of those kingdoms, there's only two or three kings that were not absolutely corrupt and engaged in following the fallen ones in their destructive agenda. And this led to great suffering and heartache for all of the Jewish people. In fact, the northern kingdom eventually is destroyed and vanishes, and only the southern kingdom remains, but it too is eventually taken away into captivity the city of Jerusalem is destroyed by Babylon, and the temple of God, Solomon's temple, is destroyed as well, completely leveled to the ground. A pretty stark example of what nihilistic philosophy desires to do. However, the second temple was, was built, and this is the temple that existed at the time of Christ and the birth of the Messiah. So, uh, through all of these struggles, and the people in Babylon exile, Babylonian exile, uh, we see God's hand at work through the prophets in the Old Testament to keep presenting the message of this conflict and what goodness is as opposed to evil. And uh, eventually, around 500 B.C. or so, around that time period, 5600 B.C., the captives in Babylon are released to come back to Israel. The city is rebuilt, and uh, the work on the temple is started again. So, eventually, by 3 B.C., and now we have the evidence, it's remarkable, really, we have the evidence that identifies the exact date of the birth of Jesus, which a lot of people will be stunned to hear this, but it's really the fact, was on September 11th, 3 B.C. Okay, I find that very interesting in light of the attacks on the Twin Towers in this country on September 11th. And there's some other important historical events that occurred on September 11th as well that we don't have time to go into here. But anyway, uh, after the return from exile, you had the New Testament era and the intertestamental period where a lot of these writings that were prophetic occurred about what happened in the Cosmic War. The most significant of these is the book of First Enoch, which was viewed by people in the New Testament era um, as authentic and historically true. So much so that Jesus several times in the Gospels references that story as accurate and true, even going to where the watchers on Mount Hermon came, initially are thought to have come down to create their conspiracy to overthrow God's kingdom and destroy humanity. He even took his disciples to that very mountain, and he does some teaching there that's very interesting, but cannot truly be understood without this backstory of the cosmic warfare, because that's what he's referencing. And then there are references to the Watchers and to the Fallen Ones as well throughout the writings of the Old Testament. Paul does this numerous times, but most significantly, Jude in the book of Jude and Peter in his writings, his letters, uh, talks directly about what First Enoch says actually happened. Uh, that's a narrative, if you're really interested in this, that I would recommend you read, but I would also recommend you take a look at the two commentaries by Dr. Michael Heiser on the book of First Enoch. It's a very scholarly work that clarifies a lot of details 
and does some really good explanations for what was actually happening. So, uh, all of that's going on. We are told, <clears throat> according to the New Testament, that this conflict will continue until the end of the age and the return of Christ, the second coming. So it would be no surprise to people, uh, if they understand this conflict, to see this same struggle and conflict going on today in our world. In fact, I would suggest to you this. If you were an alien from another galaxy and you came to the Earth, and the only thing you knew about this planet was that there was a God, Yahweh, who created it, who called forth a people called the Jews to be his representatives of goodness and righteousness. And if you knew that there was a rebellion in heaven that created a great cosmic war and fallen angels were loosed upon the earth and they were fighting against God, if that's all you knew about this planet, as you looked at current events going on on this planet, you would likely conclude, oh, here is an, a, a manifestation of Yahweh and his goodness, and here is a manifestation of those who oppose and rebel against his goodness. And you certainly would see this played out in the Middle East and the hatred of the Jews. The attempt still going on to destroy the Jews is remarkable if you think about it because the Jews have always been a small group of people historically, a people who are relatively powerless in terms of politics in the world, world politics, and yet when you think about it, it's remarkable to consider that this small group of people historically who have been persecuted from all the way back to the time of Egypt, down through the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance, into modern history, still exist in spite of all the efforts to wipe them out. And yet, you have Samaria, Acadia, you have the Amoritic culture, you have Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, and others down through history who have all come and gone who were considered the greatest political military powers of their time. And yet they vanished, disappeared. Egypt, another example. And it becomes mysterious in a way to understand how is it that these this small group of people who are identified as Jews continue to exist in spite of it all as these other great kingdoms who were bent on their destruction came and went. Uh, and I also need to point out to you that there is no such thing as a Jewish race. Abram was Hurrian. He was from those people, that tribe. He was not Jewish by race. The Jews are not a race. They are a people that are called out and set apart. So, uh, you have Jews appearing from different tribes and cultures as they intermarry with the descendants of Abraham. And it's not racial. It is religious. This is the nature of Judaism. It is religious as a being called out by God himself to have a special relationship with him to bless all of mankind. So, that's important to understand as well, I think. Um, in AD 70, when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem and the second temple, they, uh, their desire to eradicate the Jews constituted what's called the diaspora, where the Jews were scattered all over the world. Okay, And the idea was, as they were scattered, of course, the, the sacrificial system and the keeping of the law in Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple disappeared. And the idea was the Jews would be assimilated into different cultures all over the world, and they would vanish. Ironically, they did not. They kept their Jewish identity in spite of anywhere they were sent or the pressures brought to bear on them to cease to be Jews from a religious standpoint. So that's also very interesting and intriguing, I think. It's very difficult to account for how that could just happen with this small group of relatively powerless people. Now, there are great changes that occurred in Judaism from the Middle Ages forward. One of those is the rise of rabbinical Judaism as the authority resting right alongside the Old Testament scriptures, which created problems for the Jews because the rabbinical authorities sometimes were saying and doing things which, frankly, were a contradiction 
to the true narrative of the Old Testament and the backstory of the cosmic conflict between God and fallen angels. Uh, but this, of course, happened. Middle Ages forward, uh, there were also divisions that began to occur in Judaism that by the time you get to the modern era, the 1800s, 1900s, and up to the present, turned into branches of Judaism, some very conservative, others very liberal. The more conservative ones adhered to the authority of Scripture more closely and uh, were concerned with living according to the laws of, of the Old Testament in what has come to be in Yiddish and modern uh, Jewish understanding as kosher living. Okay? Um, the more liberal, however, to the extreme liberal, departed from a high view of the Old Testament, the Bible, and even departed from a high view of religious Judaism and rabbinical teaching to become more cultural Jews. And those Jews became more and more absorbed into the larger cultures in which they dwelt while retaining their Jewish customs as a cultural identity, but not so much emphasizing a relationship with God as a special people who are called to bless the entire world by bringing to the front, to the forefront, the knowledge of this war between the truth and the lie, Yahweh and fallen angels, and promoting the redemption of all people through the Messiah. So you have these different branches that came out. Now, I will be talking more about that later when we get to, to modern Judaism in the next couple of sessions. But I just wanted to make you aware that that is all there. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out here as a background is about the, the uh, sacred writings of the Jews and the additional material that stands alongside those sacred writings that we call the Old Testament. Uh, the sacred scriptures comprise basically three kinds of writing. The Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Okay, The Torah involved the law and history of ancient Israel. The prophets, the writings about God speaking directly to the people as both proclamation prophecy, which is prophecy that says, here's the situation you're in, and here is my word and my will concerning what you should do next. And also foretelling prophecy or predictive prophecy which is about what will come in the future. This is what a lot of people get most excited about is what does the Bible say about the end times? Well I would tell you it says quite a bit but uh, the bulk of prophecy in the Old Testament is not about the end times. It's about the cosmic warfare between Yahweh and fallen angels and how the Jewish people were supposed to respond at particular times and places in Jewish history. It was God's word spoken in those situations. Now, the content of the Hebrew Bible is really in three parts. The entire text is called Tanakh, sometimes with the acronym capital T, capital N, capital K. Uh, the first part of that is the Torah I mentioned, which are the teachings and the core of biblical Jewish identity. That is God's uh, messages about who he is, what he's like, why he called the Jewish people, and how they should then live with one another, but also in relationship to non-Jews or Gentiles. But it also uh, is a history of God's work in the cosmic war, and part of that history goes back before people, it talks about, but also his work through the Jewish people in history. The second part is called the Nevi'im, or the prophets, and that, of course, is proclamation prophecy and prediction prophecy, I said, as I said. And then the third part is the Ketavim writings, which are aesthetic and imaginative reflections, observations, and commentaries, which are designed to be oftentimes poetic in nature, but are also designed to teach truths about who God is, his essence, nature, and how we should live. So, um, that's the basic overview of the sacred writings of the Jews. I would also tell you that rabbinical tradition writings began to emerge later by the Middle Ages, and these you may have heard referenced as writings like the Talmud, the Midrash, and the Kabbalah. Okay, so those writings are not, were not viewed as, are, are, are not viewed really historically as equal to, in terms of authority, as the Word of God, the Old Testament but they existed alongside uh, over time. 
They existed alongside. Now, I would tell you, the unlike many of the other religions we've looked at, the evidence for the authority of the Old Testament is immense. And one of the reasons is because the Old Testament was produced between 1200, roughly 1200 B.C., the time of Moses, down to 4 to 500 B.C., which is the return from the Babylonian exile. And all of these writings existed in the intertestamental period and existed at the time of Jesus in a variety of forms, and there were many, many copies. And these were meticulous copies that were very carefully preferred, prepared. So much so, in fact, that if a scribe made an error, instead of just crossing it out and fixing it, they destroyed the entire document, started over, so that it, ha it would have no blemishes. Okay? So it was very meticulous, and it was done not by a single individual, but by by committees, if you will, that oversaw that everything was done exactly so, to make it accurate. We fortunately have a lot of that material, and when you add the New Testament writings into that, it becomes immense. For example, there's no other religious view in the world that has anything close to this. As I've told you, the Hindu writings, the Buddhist writings, the uh, writings of Shintoism, all of those writings came several hundred years later than the times that are being described and the people being described. Not so with the Old and New Testament. In fact, the entire New Testament was in circulation, completed many copies by the end of the first century. That's within uh, 50, 70 years of the life of Jesus. These writings were all in circulation. So a lot of people living at the time of Jesus were in a position to say, yes, this material is accurate, or no, it's not. And yet, we don't find uh, writings from that time period that say that these that the writings in the New Testament were not accurate. It just doesn't happen. So there's a lot of reasons to accept the authority of both the Old and New Testament as accurate. Not that you have to believe in God because of it, but that it's not made up stuff. It's historically authentic and accurate. Um, just how much exists? Well, if you counted up all of these documents, Old and New Testament manuscripts and partial manuscripts and fragments, put it all together, you would have 65 to 70,000 documents from the times, from the eras where these events occurred. That's an immense amount of literature. It is the greatest collection of manuscripts from the time that these events occurred in the history of the world. There's nothing like it anywhere else. In fact, the second highest collection of manuscripts is Homer's Iliad, which is about 5,000, but even those manuscripts, the earliest ones, date from several hundred years after Homer. So there's no way to go back and authenticate. And that's the second highest number. If you were to stack those up side by side, you would have a stack of manuscripts of Homer that was four or five feet tall. You would have a stack of biblical manuscripts that is three times the height of the Freedom Tower, which is over 5,000 feet. In fact, if you stood at the base of that stack of documents, you could not begin to see the top. So, it's a remarkable amount of information available to be examined to authenticate what the Bible claims actually happened. Okay? So, that's just important to know, I think, as well. Uh, and this foolishness that one time existed that it was just a group of guys that got together and made up stories is just absolutely false. That is not a scholarly view anymore. Again, you don't have to believe the stories. You don't have to believe in God. But there is no reason to say these are just made up stories. There's a lot of reason to say they can be documented, authenticated, and verified. So I, that's a good thing because it enables us to make better critical decisions about the content instead of just accepting, oh, I'm going to say that uh, Siddhartha Gautama actually existed and did the things that the, that the Buddhist writings say, even though we have no writings from the time that he lived to authenticate his life. It all came from much later. So, hopefully that gives you some idea of what we're dealing with, all right? Um, I would also tell you that as we progress forward, we will be still emphasizing this backdrop, the big story, 
which is really a story of God at war with fallen angels. In fact, reading the Bible makes very little sense unless you accept that is the core and the center of the entire biblical narrative. Uh, for example, it would be like reading Lord of the Rings and ignoring the conflict between elves, dwarves, men, and Gandalf, and, and the conflict with Sauron and Saruman and the dark forces that produce the Orkai orcs. To say that that doesn't provide the background for what's going on in Middle Earth and the return of the king misses the heart and soul of that narrative and the essence of it. And Tolkien knew this. Tolkien was a, was a believer in Christ. He was a Christian, a Roman Catholic, and he wrote Lord of the Rings with that backdrop in mind. He understood the story in the Bible of fallen angels and their conflict, their rebellion against Yahweh, and the conflict that ensued and how that eventually led to the coming of the Messiah and the overthrowing of their power. He understood that. And of course the Bible looks forward to the return of the king, the return of Jesus. The Lord of the Rings story looks forward to the return of the king and a peaceful kingdom that will emerge as a result. The parallels are striking. Are amazing. So I would invite you to read it with that through that lens, whether you believe in it or not, but just read it through that lens to understand what's really going on. So the story of the Old New Testament is the story of God and what he's doing to redeem and bless mankind, all of mankind. And that and it tells the story of who he is, what he's like, why he is doing what he's doing, which in essence is love, that he loves his creation. And eventually how he accomplishes that through coming himself in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, to overthrow the fallen angels and their power. It's an incredible epic story. Uh, Tolkien himself said his epic story, while it was epic, is just a, a small presentation of the great cosmic story that is told by, by the Old and New Testament. Okay, we'll stop there. That's plenty for you to think about at this point, but I want to give you that backdrop and foundation to work from as we begin to talk in more detail about the Jews, their beliefs, and their history. And I hope this will be a great time for you and really be informative, and, and also you'll, you'll find it highly interesting as well. So I look forward to seeing you in class. Please take a little bit of time to, to listen to and watch this video as your foundation and backdrop. Thank you. You have a wonderful day. Stay safe as always and be kind. I look forward to seeing you. Standing in the darkness out on the ledge Over your head, way over the edge In a hollowed out place Where night is falling You fold your hands, you pretend to pray Say it doesn't matter anyway The voice of grace and love is calling Cry as you will sound angel wings moving all around the Lord of hosts touching hallowed ground in the form of man broken bread and wine salvation sure in the sun divine the sacrifice to end all your Faith and hope and love combine to raise the dead, feed the vine as Eden falls, and the world is burning. A beautiful outlaw rising like a star, the shape of God in a human form. Sanctuary, safe and warm. Following ones are fading, dying, spinning 
lost in shadow Subtle wink from a demon's eye The smell of blood in a baby's cry Shepherds sleep in a highland meadow Wormwood comes like a falling star Scroll unfolds in a cosmic war A diamond shines in the highway top Transcending time beyond the law Ross and nails the dust of death where life prevails. The dream restored, incense forgiven. Promises made in the upper room. Proof displayed in the empty tomb. Death condemned to the cracks of doom.
Standing in the darkness out on the ledge Over your head, way over the edge In a hollowed out place Where night is falling You fold your hands, you pretend to pray Say it doesn't matter anyway The voice of grace and love is calling Cry as you will Sacrifice to end all your need. Faith and hope and love combine to raise the dead, feed the vine as Eden falls, and the world is burning. A beautiful outlaw rising like a star. The shape of Daily lying in a twilight world Lost in shadow A subtle wink from a demon's eye The smell of blood in a baby's cry Shepherd sleeps in a highland meadow Wormwood comes like a falling star Scroll unfold Cosmic war, the diamond shines in the highway top. Transcending time beyond the law, you live and move without a flaw. The perfect one, the king of heaven. The crown of thorns of cross and nails, the dust of death, where life. The dream restored, incense forgiven Promises made in the upper room Proof displayed in the empty tomb Death condemned to the cracks of
Chinga, 